Let me show you how a hacker operates on a phishing attack and what, how can Curator detect those things. So we start by having a clean slate, uh, no offenses here in Curator, and we have two Windows 10 systems. I actually cloned this one. This one ends in uh, MTV is the name, the IP address ends in 21. Again, I cloned this machine and this is the clone one, it's MTT and ends in 31. And as you see, both machines are fully patched, uh, fully updated. There's, I'm not exploiting the vulnerability here. And everything is going to start with opening a Word document. So let's say that this Word document came as an email, as typically the case, and the guy is going to click it. But before I open it up, let me show you what's in it. In that Word macro, in that Word document, there is a single line macro with this PowerShell that executes this command in here. We downloads from this IP address 124, which is this Kali system here. It's going to download an executable. That is my love64.exe. And you'll see that I have made uh, the same uh, efforts that a hacker will do in obfuscate the attack to they say that they know that they have an SIEMD and they're going to try to avoid things that will uh, reveal its presence. So the first thing that I did is uh, I actually compile this executable using MSS Venom and I've done separate videos where I show that uh, in order to make sure that there's no threat intelligence, there's no hash that will denote the presence of this. So I made it especially for you. You are a target of choice, not a target of opportunity. And when uh, that is downloaded, then I started off as a process. But again, in the spirit of uh, avoiding detection, I have used a feature in PowerShell called encode, and I have encoded base64 that command which transform, I mean, that is not what the encode base64 is for, but the bad guys are using this in order to make sure, well, Curator will never know what the heck is actually in here. And by the way, this is the simplest obfuscation. We do detect this and many other more sophisticated type of obfuscation. So let's actually, as we, we have here, the fish rod ready when the, bite, uh, when the bait uh, is bitten. Let's actually open the Word document and I didn't put any emphasis on the social engineering of this, right? So, uh, so I'm, we can close that because we got a session, right? And to prove that this is a session, let's say that I'm in Russia and I want to get into that machine. All I need to do is issue these command sessions interactively, one, which is the only one that I have. And if I ask for a shell, you see that I'm right there. If we do a dir that's the desktop and we, we we see the same thing here that subpoena document in there but the problem for me as an attacker right now is that i have i'm a nobody i'm a standard user i don't have admin rights and in order to do things uh, i need to escalate pre particularly the first thing that the attacker will try to do is achieve persistence you see the first time they get in they don't want to do too much they just want to make sure that the machine will be theirs uh, for, for, for as long as they want to. So, and that is what is called persistency. But in order for me to achieve persistency, the easiest way is to escalate privileges. So become admin or higher. Uh, and right now, as you can see, I, I'm nobody. And if I want to escalate privilege in Windows, in Windows there is a protection. So if I open something, let me open the command from here. And if I try to run it as an administrator, you see that UAC, the user access control. So unless somebody clicks yes here in the US, and that person in Ukraine will not escalate privileges. So this attack might be, you know, might not be as good as we wanted to, but we'll see that where there is a will, there is a way. Let me show you how the, the guy will escalate privileges in order to achieve persistency very quickly. So I'm going to exit this shell, this, uh, and here in Metapreter, 
and I'm going to send this session to the background because I definitely need it. One important thing is that I fooled the guy once with that document. I'm not going to be able to fool him once, uh, twice. So that's what I need to achieve persistency. Um, so in order to do that, what we're going to do is I'm going to use another exploit from the Windows family, and this is the standard interpreter toolkit for local machines that bypasses that pesky UAC, right? Bypass user access control. The type that works in Windows 10 is called Ford Helper. And I hit enter. And now if I set the first session, the only one that I have as a trampoline for this one, uh, no, it's actually set session, sorry. Set session one. And I do an exploit to type this well, exploit. Notice that a second session gets created, bypassing the UAC. You can read it right there. So now this session, and you may have seen a flashing, that was a PowerShare flashing that the end user may or may not seen. Uh, but I, this session is very powerful. In fact, if I just issue the command get system, I'm not just admin and system, kernel access. I can do with this machine whatever I want. Let's actually do some of that. So I'm going to ask for another shell here. And this shell, as you notice that actually in the system32 directory. And the easiest way of achieving persistence, let me go back to my cheat sheet here. Um, let's actually use this command. And as you can read there, what I'm doing is I'm adding an entry to the Windows registry that is going to start that my love 64 that I downloaded and I'm going to run it as a calculator. So when you look into the task manager, you see a calculator instance, you will not see that. Again, trying to obfuscate and avoid detection as much as I can. So let me paste that command here. I didn't enter, and of course completed successfully <laughs> because I have all the rights uh, to do so. So I have a cheap procedure. I can go to rest and use this machine later. So let's say that, let's pretend that I come a month later, a week later, whatever. And I want to, you know, look around. So let's say I, I go into the directory, I see whether the, this machine is good, and I determine that this machine is not good. Uh, but I'm going to move laterally to another machine, and, and this that's what I cloned this machine, also patch, as you can see here. So I'm going to move, move to the MTT machine. Uh, and how do I do that? Well, I need two things to move laterally. One, I need to know the... IP address, the host name, and then the IP address of the machine. But that's easy. I, I need to use the NetView command, and I don't even need a special privilege for that. But uh, and this is going to reveal that yeah, there are there are several machines. One MT, MTV is the one we are using. MTT is the one we want to move laterally to. And I'm going to assume that this guy has a, a, a user ID and password that works on that machine. Speaking of that, that's a server that has the usage stuff that I want. Okay, so uh, all I need is the IP address of the machine, which I can do a reverse pings, and I get that with the host name, easy. And I need the user ID and password, but that's a problem. You came to me by virtue of opening the document. I don't know your user ID and password. Well, but we'll see that now that I'm, I have, I have kernel access in here, that's not too hard. Let me actually exit the window shell And I'm going to issue back to my cheat sheet, and I'm going to issue the a command that is going to be basically the mimicat attack. I'm going to run that command that you see there. Let me run it. I'm going to paste that. And by the way, the, the password of this machine is Q1D3M0, and you're going to see it <laughs> revealing its secret right there. I have the password. I do a who am I, I get the user ID, so I have the user ID, the password. I'm going to try to move laterally to the other machine in order to uh, keep on looking around. And to do that, I actually built the command piece by piece. So that's a variable with the user ID. That's the password we just got. That's the IP address of, the, of that MTT machine we want to move laterally to. And this is the rest of the commands to actually achieve that. But... Instead of doing it like this, I, I actually put it here in a single line. I added these extra lines in order to do the encode base 64. Again, I'm avoiding detection. 
And if you have not seen Encode Base64 in action, let me actually copy that and show you how that command, let me actually, I, I'm going to even use the victim machine here, that's the one we have. I'm going to invoke PowerShell and I'm going to paste that command here with all those variables and when I hit enter it becomes that blob. That's the encode base 64 version of it. Again to avoid detection. Let's actually run it just like that. So in order to make sure that you haven't gotten confused in here, let me send this session to the background and do an inventory of the sessions that we have. If we issue the sessions command, we have two sessions, both with MTV, because I haven't moved laterally yet. The one, the first one is the one that escalates, that, that couldn't escalate privileges, the, the plain vanilla one. The second one is the one that escalate privileges. Let me actually go into the first one. Sessions interactively one let's ask for a shell and I'm gonna paste that obfuscated command back to my cheat sheet I put it everything once obfuscated it's right here copying into the clipboard let me go to that machine and paste that command and notice that bang I got a third session session number three be open and that is with the address that ends in 31, that's the MTT machine. I have moved laterally. In fact, to prove my point, let me exit the shell. Let me send this session to the background. Let's do an inventory again. And we see that we have a third one here with MTT. I move laterally. So I can escalate privileges, I can do, you know, everything else. Uh, but as a, as a bad guy, I'm trying to avoid logs because I know they, they may have an SIM and they may get the logs. So let me clear all the Windows logs. That's easy. So I'm going to go back interactively into the session with the special privilege, which is session number two. I'm going to issue the clear EV command that wipes all the logs. So I have a void detection as much as I can. I move laterally and ha that's how the bad guys uh, work. I, again, I'm, I'm doing this one after another, but they typically do that, you know, taking the time to avoid detection. Let's actually go back to Curator and see if Curator saw any of these in spite of all the obfuscation. Let's refresh the screen. <laughs> Boy, look at that. We have four offenses that detected that. Let me open them up and show you around. So notice that uh, some are from the machine that started all, the, the, the 21, and the other one is when I move laterally uh, to it. Let's actually see what are the rules that allow Curator to detect some of this. So let's take a look at this, uh, the first offense, the 102, and display the rules that were in here. Remember the things that we did? Bypass the user access control with for helper, you know, modify the registry, and just, these are some of the things that were actually found in here. Now, do I need to have all these things in order for me to detect that? No. Only one of these things that Curita will detect will be good enough for an offense to fire that invites you to investigate and find out what happened. But Curita has a ton of very good rules for detecting what's happening inside the kernel of this machine. Actually, this is leveraging the Sysmon uh, free component from Microsoft and give us visibility into what's happening on the kernel. This is regardless of whether you have a, an, a, an EDR technology or not. So, and I will argue that you should do a belt and suspender approach and if you have sensitive machines, sensitive target servers, uh, desktop machines that are of people very important, that you should go with both, a good EDR as well as uh, getting curator to see what's happening on the kernel of that machine. And there are other offenses here. I'm going to not bother you with the details. So uh, this, I hope, I, has given you a, a quick idea of how the bad guys operate, how they avoid detection. How, but you, once we get visibility into what's happening in the Windows kernel, uh, this is what you get. I mean, they are not going to... Uh, remain hidden in here we will detect their presence in real time 
for you to take actions. Uh, probably you may want to uh, re-image these machines and you know whatever is the action. And we have a sole component that helps you with the automation of that. I've done videos on that as well separately. So let's keep it short in here, and I hope that that uh, gives you a good idea of how the bad guys operate uh, when they do fishing.